on for a long time. History, how did you get lost with it? And watch the show regularly. <laughs> and send them a screenshot. And we're ready. <laughs> this year we are celebrating an iconic 10 years 10 seasons of any queer talk show running on any tv station anywhere and anytime in the history of canada is a big deal um and we are proud we have gotten here with lots of love and support from you our viewers and community and allies uh, and you, who may have dropped by because you're just curious to see what's on TV and you landed on this show. So thank you for being here. And we continue taking you down memory lane, as I promised, on the premiere episode. Uh, by having on the couch this season, uh, the icons, the trailblazers, and the legends of our community. And along the way, learn as much history as we can. The dance floor is one of the most revered places in our community. Being on the dance floor for me personally is a spiritual experience. For a long number of years, I haven't had a lot of time to do that lately, but you know, publishing magazines and hosting talk shows and all that takes time. But um, there was nowhere I would rather be uh, than lost in music on the dance floor, feeling the energy of the other people, uh, dancing, sharing the rhythm together. Music is powerful. And when we share it together in one space, it is very, very powerful. My guests with an S today are a dynamic duo with an iconic status uh, in our community's dance floors. They have certainly caused our community and the world to sweat buckets dancing to their very energetic remixes of some of the most loved artists I believe, and they can correct me if I'm wrong, it is their remix of Whitney Houston's It's Not Right But It's Okay that made it success that it was, and it still is. Many of you know that I started writing and recording songs in the last three years, and when I first started, and this is more of a, more of a joke, one of the first thoughts that I had was that I, I know that I arrived if Thunderpuss mixes for me, <laughs> because that's their iconic status in the community. They are the creme de la creme, as, as far as I'm concerned. And along uh, their remixes, they are also successful artists, producers, songwriters, and all that on their own. Please help me welcome Barry Harris and Chris Crocs from Thunderpaws. Yay! Hi, Antoine. Welcome to the show. I hope I did you good with the with the intro. <laughs> yeah, it was very impressive. I need to make you the new press agent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm available for more work, yes, <laughs> on top of everything that I do. Uh, so first, before we start on anything, uh, curious to know if there's any story behind the name Thunderpuss. Um, well, yeah, it was when we were, uh, kind of did the first the first track ever. It was actually a song for a, a compilation on Priority Records, and uh, we did this uh, dance cover of I Just Want to Be Your Everything, the old Andy Gibb uh, okay. song. And so it was kind of like we did the thing, and then it was just like, oh, now we need to name the project. And it's like, you know, any <laughs> band sits around, and you just kind of start throwing out everything, every you know, combination of initials, a combination of whatever. And uh -huh. I, was, I was married at the time, and my wife just said, well, what about something that sounds kind of like James Bond, like erotic thunder pussy? And just, <laughs> just like that, and it was kind of like, First of all, I was surprised at that kind of, and then it was just kind of like Thunderpuss. Wait, that's that's pretty. That's pretty cool. Very sound. nice. And it just yeah. sounded kind of James Bond, but it also kind of sounded a little um, like cult movie. Like I was always a big fan of really, you know, underground cult movies. And then yeah. I was thinking of of Death Race two thousand. And at <laughs> the time, it was like this was ninety seven. So everything was all leading up to everything was becoming two thousand this two thousand that. Uh, it was kind of a running joke. So the 2000 part was a a little nod to the to the to the the cult movie thing, but then it was also an internal joke because the arc of most remixers would be they'd have a really big year, then they'd blow up, and then they'd have about a, like a two year run, and then just be done with. So it was kind of looked at as almost as an expiration date, and it was just kind of like a little joke. So that was that was the origin of it. <laughs> I like it. Actually, that's kind of the sense that to me it's it does sound very James Bondy. It does same some sound like have as an old energy kind of thing like Thunderdome that sort of thing Mad Max yeah totally yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and it definitely uh, it definitely was a good um um it was it was it was it was a good entree because that was kind of the question you asked was 
generally the first question that always came. Oh, up. Yeah, so yeah. It definitely. I thought got, I was being got, a dick. <laughs> it definitely got some, got some, uh, you know, got some people. It's memorable. It's memorable. It's memorable. Well, the other story that I'm sure you've been asked: How did you guys come together? Chris Alkvary, you want to take that? Well, that goes back to '91 when okay. I was working on on Concan stuff. I met Chris in. Um, uh, in New York, it was okay. the New Music Sum Summit, was it not? New, New Music Summit oh, wow. in New York City, yeah. Yeah, in 91. And because you, you were also doing editing and working for Hot Tracks and stuff, because I also had DJ and, and record uh, store experience, I was very well aware of Hot Tracks and all the stuff and editing that he was done. So we met at the studio there in 91. And um, over the years, well, t Chris was pretty much my tech support throughout the 90s. I'm, just, I'm so glad that you're you're, you're saying that. I, I, we're like, that. I have friends. So, so we have so we had a mutual friend at Atlantic Records. Uh, the person who signed Barry Harris or, or signed Concan was Mark Nathan. And he was somebody, he was one of the first people that I met because I was doing radio in Las Vegas and hot tracks. And I was going to the new music seminar and the 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 PD at my station said, Hey, you should meet this guy. Mark Nathan, it'd be really good. He's he's for Atlantic Records. He's he that he signed that Concan record that we're playing, and I'm like, oh my god, I love that that thing. Uh -huh. Sounds like New Order. That's cool. And so I remember he told me at the time what the next single was because Mark had told him, and he goes, if you go there and you have like an edit of the next single, that'd be a really good you know entry to Atlantic Records. So uh -huh. I did like a little edit on a reel to reel tape and took it to Mark at his office, and then he's like, hey, you want to? come to this mix session with John Luongo in the studio tomorrow night. And I was like, yes, yeah. please. Like, it was like, you know, this legend. If you're, first of all, being in New York City, it was it, my first time or second time. So it was like, you know, small town kid, wide-eyed in the city. And then it was get to An exciting time at New York, too. A massive studio, like like one of the premier studios. And John Luongo, who's, like, you know, the guy who almost invented the 12-inch mix. And Barry was there that night because he was also – going to seminar and was you know with with mark all the time and so we were just yeah sitting in the in the lounge and i know that day very well not just because i met barry but because it was also my birthday that day <laughs> and i remember because at one point somebody asked to see i think they saw my id i think maybe to check my age or i don't know somebody uh -huh. was like hey what, what's a nevada driver's license look like and then mark <laughs> just looks at it he goes like well happy birthday and i just remember it was like the coolest birthday i could have ever wanted to be like oh. in new york and you know i was already a fan of barry's work and so it was just like this really cool thing and while we were talking there i was kind of like well so what do you use and he's like oh i'm using performer and i was kind of complaining you know mark of the unicorn is the company that made this so the software mm -hmm. and i was way deep in it and i just kind of said oh if you ever have because at the time you'd have to call tech support and it would just be a busy okay. line Okay. And it'd be busy yeah. for days. Like you'd wake up in time for them to be starting work in Boston and it'd be, it would just be a busy signal. There was no call waiting. There's no voicemail. There was no internet. There was no email. And so I just said, I opened my mouth and I was like, Oh, if you ever have any questions. And so like a couple of days later, Hey, I'm trying to, how do I, <laughs> da -da 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 -da. And, oh, I should open my literally hour. And, and for actually, Better part of almost six years, I think. Is, is if how you long could go went. back, if you could go back to your younger self, back to the future. Yeah, what you could say is, don't do it, Chris. Don't do it. Don't, Let me out. give you an eight hundred number you can call. <laughs> <laughs> but it was through that that we, you know, not only had, you know, like because we would literally because I'm I'm a night owl and Barry, you know, anytime we, anytime anyone that works in the studio, you become this weird mutant that you know shuts yourself off from the rest of the world, and yeah. so we would just be on the phone talking but also kind of talking but then through that found mutual things that we loved with certain things right. like music so and, you, and you also started and you connected that's our a mutual yes. very very uh uh dark sense of humor <laughs> which came out through those calls as well well we're yeah, happy that you guys great. connected yeah. uh and since then you mixed for madonna britney spears christina aguilera whitney houston Enrique Iglesias, Jennifer Lopez, Mary J. Blige, Celine Dion, Cher, Janet Jackson, Spice Girls, <laughs> and I'm guessing more. Any favorites? Yeah. I don't mean artists. I don't like the energy of comparing artists, but any favorite project you worked on during your whole time working together? I always have mine. I know what yeah. mine is. Go for it. Oh, mine, mine is Mary J. Blige, No More Drama, because it was in three parts. It was, we were really in sync. We were really... 
working well together, right? That, that was at the peak of us being really in sync and really contributing. You to have it. no idea what that what that mix did to my life. I love it. <laughs> I, I did too. And it's it's actually one, it might be the first mix. At that point, we were so um, in demand, there was no time to ask for us to ask to do something. But I, I, I saw the video on MTV that morning. It had just come out. Great video. Uh, luckily, Mark was also helping us with Get Remixes, and he worked at Universal at the time. Oh, and yeah. I probably said to Chris or Mark or Chris first, I said, we, we have to do this No More Drama song. We have to. Uh, yeah, so you came to work that day, and you were like, I just oh, saw the new Mary J. Blige and, and her vocals, and you you were just yeah. like beside yourself. Yes. And it's like, yeah. we need and to I do this. Why. And so then I, we, yeah, then so I asked. Go I have screamed my lungs out to your, to your, to your Mexican <laughs> death floor. So uh, basically, our heart, blood, guts, and soul really went into everything, but in particular, what for some reason there was a very much more emotional attachment to that so song. Do you have a different opinion, Chris, or the same? Well, that's definitely that's definitely one of them. I mean, obviously, Whitney, because of everything that it that it you know that it opened up, and at the time, it was kind of like everything was still new and fresh and exciting, like every little thing. And it was also like, you know, we'd done a couple things as Thunder Post, but mainly for, you know, um, inner hit records and for a couple things. But then it was like, oh my God, Whitney, H hold on, Whitney Houston? Wait a minute. And uh -huh. it was funny because we were given, we were sent a dat and it was like, and there were two songs on it. It was the original version of um, It's Not Right. And there was also If I Told You That. Okay. And, and they said, just pick whichever one. And I'm like, well, this other one, the the track is really really low energy but her vocal has so much attitude like and was just really hooky and so the, whitney's the obvious one mary j blige is definitely another one that i that it was just yeah it was a masterpiece i'm so proud of it there's another one that that gets me every time and every time i play it it's one of those oh, i love this record and that's michi lu and uh, michi one and luchi lu yeah. body rock okay. just because i think it's such a it's just a flawless record. The mix, it's exciting. It takes dramatic turns. It's kind of a kind of a dark horse as far as like it wasn't a massive hit, but it just makes me so happy every time I hear it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, yeah. uh, you kind of answered my next question, which was uh, to ask you to tell me the full story of It's Not Right, But It's Okay. Uh, and another, yeah, I mean, that was, honestly, that was pretty much remix. it, you know, and then kind of the whole thing unraveled uh from there and then uh yeah it all happened and but then it was weird because we were in la at the time and when the song really started to happen you know this new york at the time was the center of the dance universe especially yeah. in north america and um, so we would he we'd get these reports of like junior played it for 35 minutes and blah 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 and this happened and this happened but it but nobody was playing it in la yet and radio really? hadn't been playing yeah la was the last the last part of the country that actually took it over as a hit so i mean it happened out of europe first uh -huh. but then we were kind of getting these reports and it was just that exciting thing that just kept like developing but we were only getting it like second hand and then the thing that really did it for me was um i went to meet him uh like the we did the mix around what november and then meet him is in end of january in france and took a side trip to rome and I was just going to the Vatican with my label partner. We were just kind of like taking a little side trip. And I'm walking down the street in Rome and I hear the mix coming out of a clothing store. And it was like, and so I went in and oh. you know, <laughs> spoke Italian. And I'm like, this music, where's where this coming from? Where's this coming from? And she's kind of looking all confused because this hyperactive guy is like, <laughs> what, 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 what am I hearing? And then she yeah. kind of pointed to the radio. She's like, oh, the radio. And I'm like, this is on the radio. And so I was like, in. Italy, hearing it in Rome, and then on the way back that day, I heard it from another shop, like they were playing it like to death on the radio there, and that's when it all just kind of went. Oh my God, this is. I don't even. I don't even know how to feel how how it would feel because to this day, if this is playing at any party or with a group of friends, and everybody's like, "Oh my God, stop it!" and everybody jumps to the dance floor, it still has it still has that effect, and must be a really awesome feeling you guys have with that. <laughs> it's 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 crazy. It's kind of weird. It's crazy. It's yeah, kind of sometimes it's like yeah. a dream. <laughs> There's no way we thought we'd be still talking about that record in 2023. I love that. Like, it's not me. at all. 
it's making yeah. oh actually it's warming my heart because these are like these are the iconic songs that were so had so many memories on the dance floor for yeah you just don't know what is going to be iconic and sticks forever and what some some of the records that you love it goes this is this is going to be a keeper forever and yeah. ever it's like, a couple of years <laughs> and then other ones like they yeah. surprise you you just never know nice. it's funny i heard a story about um like led zeppelin did a thing where they they thought the song they were going to be remembered for in their big epic opus was Cashmere and Stairway to Heaven was just, oh, that was a track to fill out the album. And, and it's, like, it's like once you make something, you do whatever you do, but then it's it's out of your hands. You put it in the world and the world decides. Yeah, the world decides it. exactly mm -hmm. if, if yeah. it's thrown away. Fair or enough. If it becomes... I like that. I like that look, actually. <laughs> you recently went back to Whitney and got back together to produce the song Don't Cry For Me for the film I Want to Dance With Somebody. How did that come about? Well, I don't think there's just anyone else that would have gotten us back together except Whitney. That yeah. was kind of really how I got. Well, so so the uh, the, the producers, the Whitney's team, uh, yeah. uh, basically like the her, you know, the estate was not controlled by um, or is not controlled by like a big, really big management firm. And one of the people working there was the guy who hired us originally for the remix, Hosh Gorilla, oh, okay. who was at Arista Records, who now works for this company that has a whole bunch of artists. And when they were staging the um, the album. It just so happened that Rodney Jerkins is the who produced the original version of It's Not Right is the music director for the movie. So it was just kind of like, hey, we have Rodney doing this thing, but it's a it's a song that she never, you know, she performed, but it was never that officially is. recorded and it was never released because it was just a live version. And wow. he's like, they're kind of looking for something really special. And actually, Hodge's exact words, he goes, you know, if there's anything I learned from Clive Davis over the years, it was it was to have an event record. What's a, what's a record that could be an event? And he basically just kind of wanted to literally get the team back together as far as not just Thunderpuss, but also because Rodney was the producer of the original. Other people that worked. Yeah, and it's kind of like this this really amazing full. Um, logically, who they, who they go back to? The people that, that made one of their <laughs> hit songs or what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's and, and it was cool because it, it, it tells a nice story and for us it was definitely a you know a probably much needed thing and it was just and it was just kind of cool and then what really but what really did it was like there was a thing on paper where it was um um you know the concept of like hey let's get everyone and try to you know capture lighting in a bottle again which doesn't okay. always happen but then the big thing was he's gonna just listen listen to let's listen to her vocal listen to the performance and one listen was like oh my god and then it was just like really Come yeah. on, who else is going to do this justice? We have nice. to do this. Like, is that why you guys? Somebody's just going to mess it up. You know? Is that why you guys connected again? And you recently went on tour. Is that how it started? Yeah, that's literally how it started. It was, yeah. it was, it was, it was, it was Hosh calling and just saying, "I got a question to ask you," and you can say no, but just say. And the minute he was kind of the way he was saying, I'm like. I bet I know what he's gonna. He, I bet I know what he's bringing up. I didn't the know tour manager to Whitney. Uh, no, well, the guy, the uh, the the A and R guy of, no. of the project. So he was the one who just kind of said, "So there's this Whitney thing, and how would you like to?" Da -da 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 -da, and I was like, you know, uh, and then he sent the vocal, and it was like, oh, shoot, we have to do this. <laughs> so, yeah, well, I was I was Whitney. touring together. I it was it was way easier than I expected. Oh, yeah? I mean, I, I, I mean, we haven't <laughs> talked or we hadn't seen each other in 18 years. <laughs> We'd only spoken maybe three times in that time. So, oh, really? so when you just when you stopped, you, you kind of didn't stay in touch. Oh, uh, Barry, did we stay in touch? <laughs> 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 I must have missed all those Christmas cards. <laughs> yeah. And we just went on our own roads. We went, yeah, down. yeah. we yeah. just lost touch. It's just like any so. relationship or marriage or whatever, you right. just kind of go off and Absolutely. do your own thing. Yeah. And, yeah. and mm -hmm. so, and so, um, when this kind of came, there was a lot of, um, not probably a lot of baggage, a lot of whatever kind of coming with, like, oh, what's this going to be like? And then it was just funny because we, 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 you know, we talked on the phone and literally the first conversation we were talking about, you know, I called him and talked about the project and we just ended up like laughing and joking about a lot of stuff. And it was, I think it defeated a lot of the emotion. I'm happy to hear that. And then we got on the phone again and it was kind of, oh, actually, I'll, I'll say Barry's exact quote. Cause I was like, you know, I always like, I, I know his, his points to, to uh -huh. make him laugh and there are things that we both find funny. And we were talking, he's like, stop making me laugh. I'm going to have to start liking you again. <laughs> <laughs> and then you it was started. funny. Cause then we like got on the phone again and we were talking about the project. And then, you know, I think, I think also, cause it was us, not you know we were in adversaries it was like us 
against the world, like in regards to this project yeah. and the label and some other stuff and the business stuff. And so then it was just kind of like when it when I said, well, you know what's going to happen the minute this comes out. I'm guessing we're gonna get a couple of DJ interests. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm thinking about that. We'll deal with that when it comes. And literally, yes. we put out the the promo thing of the mix with our little mutual statement. And I was I was heading to uh, uh, Salt Lake City for for a gig, and I we I like the final editing was like at the airport. It was like, okay, yes, go send it now. I got on the plane for an hour, an hour and a half flight. I got off the plane and my phone was just <laughs> <laughs> and the first two calls were promoters going is it true is it true can, can, can we book you can we book you and it's like let, let, let's get through this record first and then yeah and then we got and so then the first time we got together which is when welton manners in february of this year yeah. it was literally just like what's it gonna be like we haven't talked to so long and then we were at soundcheck i was like hey what's up how did you feel barry about the touring Oh, it's riding a bike. What was the crowd's reception? What was what was how did how was it out there? What did it feel like? People uh, were hungry to see that again? Oh yeah. Yeah? Okay, yeah, cool. the people that that's what that's what made it all kind of like it diffused everything was like when people were just like Oh my God! I just bought plane tickets. I'm flying from Ohio. Wow! Wow! Oh, yeah, no people came from awesome. all over the country to kind of see that yeah. when it got announced. And then just, I just actually just got a little goosebumps thinking about just yeah. like we just oh. walk out on stage. There was an opening DJ, and we just kind of walk out, and you just felt the love coming from everyone, yeah. and all the yeah. you know all the memories and all the things, and seeing familiar faces that were fans over the years, who and some have become quite good friends. And then everyone was just kind of there to share the experience and kind of rooting for us and letting us know I, what our music meant to them. And I mean, that was just overwhelming. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't go, but I felt that even at home, seeing that you guys are doing this, it got me warm and fuzzies mm -hmm. because, like, oh my god, it's like you know things from things that we love that's coming back, kind of thing. Uh, yeah, it was. It was really that. That's the thing that that has carried it over through you know we we did what six shows i think all together so far this oh, year. Wow. Oh. and we have one coming up next week but we, we you know at each one of those i'm just grabbed by somebody at some point you know r trying to run across the room or go use the restroom and at one point somebody has just kind of said i need to tell you something and then and then and then literally i've just been drawn to tears like because i'm getting these overwhelming stories of what the music I, meant for people both the joy like what you said at the in the dance floor like you're with yeah. your friends you have this communal thing and everyone's sweating and becoming this this organism i love that but man. then these other things about like i was at the the darkest time of my life i had somebody in dallas who was like talking about like he was you know suicidal and he was like in the the worst thing was like pretty much homeless and and then something about going to the club and the dj knew that he liked thunderbus so when there was a new thunderbus production he would play it at the thing and literally the night he was going to kill himself he heard oh. a song that made him just literally rethink everything and so hearing something like that and the effect is just it's just i have to know. say you know what that's that's yeah. kind of effect of your remix of uh, no Dra no more drama it was it was at a time where I kind of needed to hear that message and the energy of that remix on the dance floors have got me through many many days where where I needed it. So, yeah, uh, the power the power of music, man. It's really yeah. It's uh, some. I guess also there's the excitement of the two of you coming back together. I was I posted on Facebook that I'm interviewing Thunderpuss and somebody was like, "Oh my God, both of them!" It's like, yeah, I, they're coming back together. It's both of them. That's. <laughs> I'm trying to think. The last time we, the time the last time we actually did. <laughs> An interview together. I I don't even know when that. Yeah, was. that's right. Actually, we really. Well, I'll be honored. <laughs> yeah, this is. I, I think the summer. last time. Well, there was something in the studio. I think when the news came to do a thing first. But I will remember one of my funny, one of the funniest, one of the hardest laughs I ever had with Barry was when we were our album was coming out on Tommy Boy, and we had to go do a bunch of press at the Tommy Boy office and we were doing this series of, it was all over phone calls like we're on speakerphone and we're just uh -huh. in this conference room and it was just a bunch of things together but for some reason once again you know i think i was trying to make him laugh or you know you're trying to kind of break things and we just started like kind of having this whole other thing going like we're talking to the interviewer but then we're kind of making jokes to each other and you know, thing. <laughs> trying to get the other one to laugh and i remember so i forgot exactly what happened but i just remember being on the floor like laughing Dude. and it was just like a lot uh any plans to do more uh to do more together to do more gig well yeah so the gigs there's well there's 
One, uh, so next week, uh, October 28th, will be in um, Denver. There is something else or two that are on the books, but we can't announce yet. But there okay. will be um, at least a Thunderpuss show or two in 2024. Wow. Uh, and, good. yeah. We'll be watching. All right, everyone. Uh, we got a lot to cover, but we're going to take a little break first and come back to chat more about each your your solo work a bit more. So let's take a break and don't go anywhere. back uh from our break and we're chatting with the thunder pause uh music finish the sentence barry makes, makes the people come together oh sorry <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind for me <laughs> barry um is is eternal um i love that line music is eternal oh my god i love it well it used to it used to feel that music was was disposable and fashionable and came and went but okay. now times have changed with YouTube and TikTok and all this stuff. And now that there's not limited record stores, all this old music is discoverable. It's never gone away. I love that. It, it doesn't die. New generations now will accept 70s and 60s. All this music is now accepted. Well, stop. You're going to make me cry. The same. <laughs> but it never used to be that before. But now That's it true. Is. We now so have the technology to preserve things. It never and, and you know what? Saying that, I now that explain. I've never actually thought of it. When when some of my nie nephews and nieces in their twenties are listening to black and white videos from the old days, is because of YouTube. The availability of this yes. music out there in the world now. Yeah. When we grew up, we couldn't. It was gone. Yeah. Deleted. That's true. We were done. That's true. The videos yeah. would never be shown anywhere again because yeah. they weren't popular. Well, because you also uh, had record companies controlling. Yeah. The yes. flow of what got released, and it's like, no, you're done listening to that. We're gonna yep. push this on. Put you. Another now song. The people, yeah. the people decide what we have the choice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Are you changing your uh, your uh, uh, answer, Chris, <laughs> from Madonna's line? <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, I, I can't use that because I didn't license it. So <laughs> I, I'll, I'll come up with an original answer. <laughs> uh, okay, you guys worked in music in different eras. You were major in the 90s and the circuit party days and all that, but you have worked on many other things since then and continue to work. Is there a difference between the songs then and now and between creating music then and now? Who wants to take first that question? Big Chris, time. Um, songwriting is completely different now, I think. I mean, there's still some songs that are written in some way, but um, songwriting, you know, traditionally from, let's say, 60s 70s all through the early 2000s uh -huh. you'd, you'd have a you'd have a uh even the song structure the viewpoint a lot of the times it would be from you know one or two songwriters or a couple of people would but it was it was a cohesive idea and it was a generally longer thing you'd have a first chorus first chorus bridge or middle eight outro chorus. you know you'd have longer a song would be longer and now what happens is you have a lot of the major artists that do these songwriting camps where they will meet you know they'll hole up in a you know in a hotel with a bunch of bunch of other writers producers and they'll have like a 10-day span where they just crash and or you know they do the entire album and everything is groups of people all contributing little tiny hooks mm -hmm. and so it's kind of like oh we'll use that from that and this from this and that, or you know or sample this and use this and let's reinterpolate that so then you see you know a song with 15 writers on it mm -hmm. and the song length is down to you know two minutes because it's 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 not as um, it's just not as uh, not as much depth to song to song at least for a lot of pop music now it's all just very. Solid. I'm grabbing my phone because there was <clears throat> there was a mem a couple of days ago that I saved on my phone that I thought was hilarious. Uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, one composer, one singer, or one songwriter. Run the Beyonce. world, uh, run the world, girls, which has like one line that just keeps repeating. Has six producers and four composers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that's like, that's that's a perfect example. And, yeah, and, you know, it's a combination of also how you <clears throat> how you consume things because you know back in the day, like if you had a record, 
you had that record. You made the made it a point to go out and get the record. You were yeah. interested in it. You played it. You had to physically do something. If you didn't like a song, you had to physically get up and move yeah. something. <laughs> but now, and and then you move. Think of how you listened to the radio back in the day. You would. That's I don't brilliant. like the song. You switch to another station. Well, now you have infinite stations playing infinite music, and so it the, the choices are just like the minute your interest is gone. You can go to five other things, and there, right. and it's also really hard to compete with the most interesting thing in the world, which everyone is holding in their hands. I was gonna say, so, so there's there's beauty to the fact that we can we can reach so much more music and all things and keep them, but there's also where where the consumerism of the whole thing is is really yeah. fast. Like you know, chew the song, get it, right, and and so like it's way it. more disposable. And there's disposable. so much coming out. The faster you know, you're just kind of like. Some somebody and it, and I see it all the time. Like somebody will work on an album. Hey, I, I've got blah blah blah. Here's my 16 song album, and then a super fan will devour it all in two days. Cool, I can't wait for the next one. You know, whereas before it was like you'd get a full. <laughs> I've worked for two cycle. years on an album. Yeah. <laughs> you'd, you'd put a thing out, then the band would tour for a year, and then they start you know compiling things to build you know another you know another piece of of work. And so things are just coming out at breakneck. It's become a a business of quantity and just constantly spewing things out instead of some some love and care and and, fair, and, fair, and fair, time fair invested in it yeah uh barry same opinion oh sorry what was the question i was just <laughs> i was listening to chris's journey i forgot what what was the is original? there any difference between the songs back and then and the creating music then and now oh well yeah well yeah um Ugh. I don't know how do I top what Chris just kind of summed everything all up you know it's just like when you talk are you talking dance music or pop music or everything in general in general uh, was my reference but is there a difference well uh, well well yeah I mean I, I I think absolutely record store culture with, with the demise of record store culture changed oh. everything along with the iPhones and stuff but just the the digital era the internet era uh, you have to remember, like, like I was saying earlier, when there was record stores, there was only so much shelf space. There was, there was only so much to be consumed. Once things were deleted, they were done, they were gone. You'd have to go to a used record store to find that old stuff. There yeah. was no YouTube. There was no TikTok. There was no other way to find that, that, that type of... Music. And I like that experience, the record stores. I love it. <laughs> well... Uh, and the whole holding and you know, yeah. feeling it. And, you got yeah. excited about going out to grab something new. physically. I'll tell you that 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 I miss I miss I don't miss vinyl because I'm surrounded by it. But <laughs> what I miss is going to another city and going to a record store oh. that I heard about or found out was the gold thing because that was like the community center. If you're a music yeah. head, whatever music, if you're into punk music, you'd go to the punk store, but you'd see the flyers of what gigs and what parties, and you'd meet somebody there that's like, oh, you should check this out. And so there was that that communal thing yeah. of being at a record store i'm sure well, barry worked at a store you would know it's like when you're there the day ups would bring a yeah, box and absolutely. you knew you wanted to get there if you were a dj you wanted to either get there when the box arrived from shipping or have a friend at that store that was going to break off a couple things for you because if you didn't get it you, you that was it you were right. you were you had no chance you'd hear a record and DJs were like, you know, hiding the label because they wanted to keep some kind of exclusivity yeah. because only three copies hit the hit the stage. <laughs> so I like that little thing. discoveries, like I, I saved this for you kind of thing. Oh, yeah. I, oh, that was the greatest thing. It was literally like a drug dealer. You go in, yeah. and you just kind of go like, hey, yeah. I, got, I got a, I got a snack for you. I think you're gonna really gonna take but, take a hit of this. And but also, like, like, yes, you got more. <laughs> but also, what record store culture made is uh, uh there was like that the, the all the subgroups and what was cool in the underground and stuff because it was you t it, it was hard to discover and be part of those cliques in that group suddenly the internet opened up you could get those records everywhere and anywhere all of now suddenly this whole underground scene is is kind of like been disintegrated because now it's not this own little clique in this world it's all discoverable now for everybody now yeah. so there's not these little cliques that oh i'm part of this group of that no everybody's now there it's all it's all exposed yeah. for the world all the little cool niches are all very discoverable by anyone all over the world and suddenly this little like i said this little or this little new york underground type clique thing or major city clique 
it's just kind of I unless I'm no, you're right. It's it's, a, it's supply and demand, and when there's yeah. limited supply, there's more demand, and now you have yes. all supply of everything in the world. So it's like, eh. no, but, what's special? You know, it's like, yeah, when you have every option, when 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 television was three channels, you go, hey, I pick, I'm gonna pick this or this or this. But then when you had cable, you have like 120 channels, and you're like, what's on? I don't know. There's nothing good on, and you just like. <laughs> You have too much, and you're just like, eh. That's actually it very doesn't, awesome. It doesn't feel special. It yeah. doesn't yeah. feel unique. Yeah. yeah. It feel Specialness unique is special. gone. It's all watered down. That's 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 more just culturally. Thank, thank you both. I'm, I'm really, really loving this conversation. It's a, <laughs> and and a, so, out of really experts in music, this is pretty valuable info, uh, viewers. Um, all right. We're going to just uh, look at uh, your individual work a bit. I'll start with Chris, since I don't know him uh, that much. <laughs> and uh, Brett Barry, I know you more. Since Thunderpuss, uh, Chris, you have worked as a solo artist, produced original music, dance remixes, again, for Madonna, Rihanna, etc. Uh, in 2008, you produced an album for Hannah Montana. Is that right? Uh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. And you, you had a show on your on the radio as well uh, for four years. Yeah, I, I I haven't continued. I I haven't stopped. I've I've kind of always continuously been on radio somewhere. Yeah, I, okay. I, I it ended up being actually eight years total on Sirius XM. Okay. Yeah. So what are you working on currently, and what and then, do you see yourself going next? Well, the other thing during during all those years, so I was I started touring like a lot, and okay. then um and kind of in different segments. So for a while, um, I I I joined up with Perry Farrell from Jane's Addiction, and we did a, a few years of touring like doing festivals and stuff i was a music director and is like on stage uh-huh. partner so got to you know see some really cool stuff and kind of go on a different thing and then i worked on Giorgio Moroder's big comeback in 2013 and did a couple of years of you know touring with him and building all that stuff and the whole while still yeah like you said um producing things um uh got nominated for a grammy and you know like just did, did a did a but it was just just producing things uh you just constantly try to stay busy uh, right now I've got a, I've got, you know, several projects that are going, I've got a label, I've got, you know, just various, uh, things that I'm involved in. I'm probably releasing more, um, like original stuff in the, in the last oh, cool. year. Awesome. I, I would definitely over the next year is going to be probably be more output because before I've always just like worked for other people and put myself like way last. And lately I've just been, I don't know, having some more stuff. I like I that. Do. Yeah. So it's been cool. Cool. Uh, Barry, after a four-year break with uh, from music, uh, from two, 2005 to 2009, you returned to the dance music scene, uh, producing, songwriting, and remixing. Uh, you got uh, to be the first producer remixer in 2010 to obtain a top five billboard chart hit in each of the four decades. Uh, 1980s, 90s, 2000s, and 2010. Congratulations. Awesome feat. Uh, you have uh, additional co-written hits such as Dive in the Pool from Queer Folk, uh, sorry, Queer as Folk, uh, the song Head, uh, which appeared on Well and Grace, and I Got My Pride, which was on Sex in the City. Uh, you produce for artists such as Jennifer Holiday, Taylor Dane, Donna Summer, Amber, Simone Denny, who, by the way, is a bestie and holds the record for most appearances on our show on the couch and says oh, hello, right. <laughs> by the way, to both of you. Uh, you have co-written with Enrique Iglesias, Carl Dixon. Uh, you found it six seconds. Uh, you recorded. Uh, you've done a lot. <laughs> Your resume is humongous. That's, that's all. That's all roller coaster all over the place. Some of that stuff is th- Thunderpuss entwined as well. Cool. Okay. Uh, yeah, some some of that stuff is okay. there. Yes. So, in div- solo wise, what are you working currently on, and where what's next for you? Oh well, uh, so. I'm always hot and cold off and on um, with things like I'm not doing a lot of music. Well, actually, no, that I did. I did. I did go back to doing some some con can stuff um, um, for fun. Um, uh, I've I've got other songs that I've done as demos and stuff. I'm not too sure what what I'm what I'm going to do with them or if I'm going to do anything at this point in time. I've like I said, I'm kind of lo- more chilling a little more these days. That's what you mentioned to me when I connected with you a while ago. That you're kind of just taking a little bit low time kind of thing. Well, yes, and the, and the DJing and DJing. And that's okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Like I mean, the th- for me, the Thunderpuss years were so seven years of insanity and intense. Yeah. 
There was a time where, and actually I was just so crazy music guy, even with the ConCan stuff since 88. So somewhere around 2005, before having to take the break, break, I just had to like basically run away from myself. So just as far as taking a break is concerned. So I'm I'm a little more um, slowed down and not crazy as far as what I want to do or if I'm inspired to do music and stuff. In the COVID era... Yeah. I will say the COVID era, like 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 Chris was doing stuff um, with Perry Farrell and something like that. My little, I was doing it more as a hobby. I was grabbing all the original tracks of a lot of the disco stuff. So yeah, for, I remember. I went back to my roots. It was so like if I could have been nine, if I had this technology, my attitude was if I had this technology in 1979, that how would I do that mix? Fair enough. So it was. I think you did Donna Summer. You did Pet Shop Boys. Did I, did I remember that correctly? Wherever I got any of the multi tracks, and I did old school type remixing like John Luongo would have done at the time. Yeah. Not, not rewriting any music, not reduce. I just taking the original 24 tracks, remixing them, adding kicks, and, and doing some editing stuff in here and there. But it was such a thrill. It made me feel 19 again. And when I really loved music and I was being naive and going back to that whole disco era when I was like 18 and 19 and just to I love doing that stuff for it was about two three years it was like a hobby it was a nice distraction yeah, music fun. I loved music again for a while you kept and us I, entertained during COVID I'll say I, actually, I, I think yeah I think I, I still have marked some of your uh, of, of your mixes from that time it was like you you kind of got us everybody was having a funk you know being at home whatever so it was nice to see some creators come back and produce some new stuff and yeah. rediscovering the disco era when it was actually really good with a lot of really great musicians hearing the bass yeah. players and the the drummers and the keyboard players and the real singers Ashford and Simpson real singers with soul it was so oh, nice I like that with soul have yeah. soul again that's yeah. what I wanted that's what I needed and that's why it was such a pleasure to go through all those to all go through all those things I don't know how yeah. many you know, I must have known about feels like. Thirty of them. Talking about old days, since I wanted to look at history, Barry was a resident DJ at the iconic and historical uh, Toronto Gay Dance Club, The Barn. You were a resident DJ, weren't you? Off and on. <laughs> I've never Off and on, right? Okay. For a while we saw you, and every, and then we missed you, and then we saw you. Okay, so, yeah. but you were my. Fa- I, mean, I mentioned that before. <clears throat> he was my one of my favorite DJs in the city. So he's responsible for countless painful days after when my legs were <laughs> so much from dancing all night on his floor. Uh, what do you remember about? We talked about the music back then and the production, but what do you remember about the club scene back then? Since you went back to DJing for a bit, any mm-hmm. different spinning back then and now? Now, like the crowd on the day, de- like to me, I know community was different back then. There was more intimacy when we got on the dance floor. We kind of it was a smaller community. We all knew each other, kind of thing. What's you your- know what? I've thought about that an off a, a lot. And and one thing they have to that I do remember uh, because I came out like I'm like. 64 so i came out in 1976 i was 16 and you have to remember at those times we all knew in our back of our minds i know this sounds harsh if i say this but in the back of our minds we all knew the world hated us (laughs) so to go to a place where we all came together and had our own culture and our music and stuff like that um that's the difference that's what made that's the difference exactly that's difference where it was home you were in this community that's what made it more community and banding together oh my god you're gonna, you are gonna make me cry when i even well, even walking to a dance club once you got there you kind of the streets and the ugliness disappeared yes. and you, yes. you were safe all of a sudden for a few hours yes yeah. Yeah. yeah and escaped in the music and it was our music yeah you know? oh, and, i'm crying <laughs> it was but then eventually as we got more and more so there's pros and cons to what <laughs> as the world changed we all got more accepted well Part of that closeness and that set started to dissipate because you know now we're starting yeah. to like more music, music was more of a connector back then but now um the the people are, are, are at least you know what i'm happy for our youth and whatever they don't have to deal with uh, well these yeah. days we are dealing with some crap as well but uh to them they're just out to enjoy the music it's not yeah. about uh the safety in the community or anything like that's that. that's the difference that's cool me- specialness again yeah. about everything kind of. yeah. uh chris um i actually where are, you're in california no i'm in las vegas nevada las vegas that's what i yeah. thought from, from chris um how is the club scene where you are historically and today 
Well, Vegas is, is I, I started my career here and then went to LA for years. And huh. um, Vegas has always been uh, like a thriving scene because it's like one of the entertainment capitals of the world. Like right now, it's really the America, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's Ibiza for North America. You've got these, you know, $50 million clubs. You see billboards for DJs everywhere. So yeah. the, the scene is really thriving. There's also a really good underground scene, like a, like a proper underground house music scene all through like the arts district and downtown. And then you also have um, festivals like, you know, EDC is here. They had half a million people come here. Oh, so awesome. um, it's, it's, and you, because you have so many people coming from around the world, it's, it's, it's pretty uh, thriving. As far as far as as far as American cities go, and and it kind of was back then, but it was like like what Barry said, it was like my you know introduction into into getting into clubs was literally I was just falling in love with this music and falling in love with the scene and falling in love and yeah, there was this thing that happened when you're five in the morning and the rest of the world is asleep and you've got this magic world uh -huh. that and that's the special thing that's like just that. yours and your friends and all that stuff. Yeah, that so that I've noticed that. That doesn't seem to happen as much at the club level, especially once you introduce bottle service and exclusivity that, you know, you get like this whole, I don't know, there's a lot of douchebags at clubs and stuff. And it's not as fun. Of, it's not as as open and inviting of his environment. But but the communal aspect, I see more at the festival level. Festivals. Because you'll have people that are way into, you know, like the the trans kid, you know, kids and the candy ravers and like the people that go to like the um, transformational festivals and these things where you just be out in the middle. You know, I've gone to parties out in the middle of the desert on a Wednesday night at three in the morning and it's like all these burners and people like that that are out there. And you're living the life, aren't you? And there <laughs> is this sense of community, you know, during COVID, I snuck down to Costa Rica and did a private rave and like oh, yeah. and, and it was these people from all these other walks of life that will meet up at festivals and things so there's it still does exist it just doesn't exist in the place where the phones are and you know there there is this thing that you know people are still very like Barry said you know the 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 communal aspect and the thing that that's special um because everything is wide open certain aspects of it are way more commercialized and with commercialization you just kind of make everything kind of this mushy middle ground that's just not really fun or exciting but then when you get on the fringes and you get into other scenes you still get that you get people that you know yeah. that want to go to industrial shows and see their friends and see this and that and if you kind of do it on the outskirts of the mainstream it's actually pretty cool but you gotta you know stumble into find it, it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's cool. what happens. You know, people, you know, before when you when it was back in the day, pre-internet, if you were the weird kid that had, you know, colored. I was the first kid in my school that had like, you know, color in my hair or whatever. And it was like, you know, getting called names and this and that. But then it's like once you find the other freaks, you're like, oh, I'm home now. You know, and so, it's, you know, that's yeah. something that is it's really important. And I think definitely people of all communities are finding those kind of things but yeah the problem is when it becomes super super over commercialized yeah. and it becomes you know a branding you know thing and everyone's focused more about the numbers than the feeling you get when you're with your people thank you thank you you guys really took us into very beautiful places of talking about music um last question and uh or last topic in this in this segment if you look back at your career what would you think what would you celebrate what would you have done differently there i know it. oh go ahead no no you go you go oh you're ready go ahead chris well the, well, the one thing i would have done because i because i've been my my not work my, with barry no <laughs> my daughters <laughs> things I think we both would have changed. No, no. The big thing, I, the big thing that is that I that I've been instilling upon. So my daughter has got, um, she's kind of in in the industry now. She works for a TV oh, cool. show on the music team, but she's got records coming out and, and has been around it her whole life. But the one thing that I'm imparting on her that I wished I would have done more was write a lot more. I wish I'd spent more time writing stuff. But I liked doing the remixes and I liked doing the production and I liked doing yeah. mixes and I like somebody going, we don't know what to do with this. And I'm like, I do. But I, I do wish I had spent more time creating original stuff. Um, okay. for a lot, Never too late, though. No. Levels. That's true. And yeah. And so, you know, I am. I mean, it's a little late, but it's it's not. Yeah. So yeah. that is one thing that because and I think I was too afraid to be an artist. 
I, I don't think I deserved to be an artist until I had learned everything because I put I put music and musicians and producers on such a high pedestal that I thought, well, I need to learn everything about this before I can be at the level of a whatever Chris oh, yeah. Jones or this or that. And not realizing that most people are just learning and making it up as they go along. So I've been yes. trying to pass that on to people that are just kind of starting their journey. And it's like, you know, do you everybody know, went through this. Don't yeah. care about everyone else. Don't worry about trying to get on this or that, because the thing is like the more you knock on a lot of doors and you try to do, you, you try to make things happen. But what I, you know, people want to be out in the, you know, at this party or that party and be seen and try to do all the networking. But the thing is when you just make stuff, when the minute you make something important, you don't need to go to anyone because everyone comes to you. So yeah. spend that energy working on your craft and getting better at what you're doing rather than being bogged down. But yeah, but yeah, it, work, work yeah. hard and don't be an asshole. Like that's, that's, that's <laughs> really it. You know, what a great advice action. Yeah. Uh, Barry. So what was the question again? Uh, if you look back to your, at your career, what, 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 are, what thoughts would you have? What would you celebrate? What you would have done differently? What I, what I would have done differently. And it's, um, Odd to admit this in front of Christopher. Yeah, ooh, <laughs> we're getting the moment. Two thousand. <laughs> it switches. <laughs> I'm saying something that he's never heard me say before. Uh, I would have stayed in LA, and I would have just gone on a big giant vacation to decompress, and not have been so and just just rebooted everything but not have taken off and been so quick to dissolve some thunderpuss and i thought that many wow many wow many <laughs> over the years i'm not just saying that i've if i could have done something differently i probably should have gone to hawaii for a month <laughs> at that point and uh um, okay now i'm getting the picture you got, oh, got overwhelmed oh. you got stressed and then you kind of ran away for a bit uh um well the times were always uh, there the times were always changing as well okay. i mean uh there's there's certain th elements uh oh i don't want to go into it so much no when you're talking about like things like writing chris i was getting very very frustrated because i was really wanting i really wanted thunderpuss to go to the next level as producers and stuff and it was so difficult to get there because everybody wanted you to remix Yes, yeah. yes, and okay. it was it was frustrating to write so much m music and compose yeah. for a flat fee. It was frustrating, yeah. and it felt that it was long overdue time that, like Shep Pettibone and Madonna, crossed over to that. It was yeah. it felt we had a couple of shots to do so, but it never felt like anybody was giving us enough shots that we were deserving. At one point, we had remixed everybody. There wasn't anybody left that hardly to yet to do and no one seemed to be wanting to give us the shot of it how allowing us to get crossover yeah. you might feel differently you were always the last call instead of the first oh, well. i felt i felt taken advantage of in many ways yeah, no, eventually you, uh, Barry, for and, sharing those, yeah. so that's yeah sorry if i'm getting a little too deep but no 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 i i i, I what an honest what an honest uh, but, look at this but i probably should have yes taken instead of uh looked at a big bigger picture but at that time it was it felt like it was about a good year and a half of frustration when we're younger we do things sometimes yeah <laughs> well that, that too yes yeah. hindsight's 2020 because yeah. you're playing this out as you go right so you don't really know where the world's leading but uh um, it was the beginning of the digital era too so everything a lot of things were changing, the changing around that time as well and you're not too sure how to change with them at the time so you. you know you, you do what you do or you did what you did and just no regrets where you can't you just kind of have to right go with the flow anyway thank you uh we're going to take a little break we still have one segment to come back to it's going to be a little bit lighter so stay stick well, with yeah, us we'll be right back thing. thank you for saying that oh <laughs> uh, well that's... barbara walters look at what you've done. <laughs> I'm getting a moment on my show, people. <laughs> you, get, you have us in tears now. Thank you. <laughs> I will be right, will be right back. <laughs> and if you want me to, I'll join away with you. And we'd fall in love. You'd be my boo. All I need is shirt and shoes. Leave everything. Welcome.
welcome back. We had a really cool moment there with Thunderpuss uh, before we close the uh, the second segment. And now and, let me say uh, my rebuttal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, do you have anything to say, Chris, on all of that? No, I'm not. I mean, I, I you know, as we went into I, I appreciate uh, Barry uh, finally saying that. So, thank Aww. You. Um, cool. yeah, I'm not. All right. Let's uh, let's get to know you a little bit uh, on a more personal um, uh, level. I guess this is what we do in the segment. What would you share with us about your upbringing? Either of you, take it. I was very, very poor, but very loved. <laughs> I was born a, a poor child. I was born a poor back child. <laughs> yeah, I was going to use that line, but I don't know if you can use that line anymore. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm from a very small town, and, you know, Carson City, Nevada is where I was raised. It was 7,000 people, and then it wow. thing, and and music became my, like, just everything in life. I mean, it's like, it just, it just became the thing that I knew I was going to leave i knew i was gonna do that i just never had any questions take you that. somewhere yeah 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 like i just knew that things were gonna happen so i was you know was a super good student super hard worker and <laughs> just you know love to make friends and and do things <laughs> I mean, it's really like i tried to just be as busy as possible because there's so much that i want to do <laughs> and, and barry are you are you ontario born toronto born where, where uh, yeah originally from barry well, we also lived in, in Toronto. Barry first. from Barry. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's, that's the saying. Oh, that's, oh, okay. So that's why, okay, you're in Barry right now, right? Uh, pretty much. Oh, so this has always been your town? When you said in Barry, I was like, did you live in Toronto? I thought Toronto was your own base or your, your birth town or whatever. No. Well, well, but it, it, as far as I'm concerned, it is. Yeah, you know, okay. Because yeah. I lived there from 78 to, to 98 before yeah. I moved to L.A. And then and back this way again. Wait, too. how far? How far? Because Barry's north, right? Yeah, yeah. Barry's north. How, how far away is that? Because I, I always thought that was a suburb of Toronto. Barry, a couple of hours. Yeah, if no, if that, it's like an hour. An hour, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, what would you share with us about your current home life, pets, hobbies, whatever you want to share, Chris? Um. Well, I I I live by myself, but I have two amazing daughters that oh. are both. Uh, kind of starting their careers now i've got a 20 25 about to be 26 year old who's working in the music industry she works huh? on the tv series bob's burgers which is very popular. oh really oh cool yeah she's <laughs> in the music team and worked on the movie and she's also got a whole kind of like career going. and then my younger daughter is uh graduating from uc irvine this year and so i'm kind of done with that i have a wonderful dog named hamilton who's one of the co-stars of my of my streaming show and um oh. Yeah, I mean, I just, I have, I have, an ama- you know, I just have an amazing collection of friends. I'm in an awesome relationship right now. And like, everything is kind of, e- everything's good. Like, I'm just generally. Do you have any hobbies happy. other than music? Um, uh, budget stand-up comedian. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, yeah. I, mean I, do, I do, most of the things I do are in art. I definitely uh, try to get outside a lot more. Any, anything around water. Uh, swimming, scuba diving, oh, cool. whatever. Like anything, anytime I'm near water is like my favorite passion in the world. Uh, I, I relate doing, usually. <laughs> I've been doing more uh, graphic design, video production stuff. I've done okay. actually several, several music videos for um, some artists that I've, um, you know, done and created and shot. Oh. So that, that's been a whole other, other side that I don't know. Um, I do a lot of, you know, other DJ stuff outside of the, outside of the, dance fair i do a lot of corporate events a lot of things like that so. some of that work is out there i'm gonna to try to find it yeah 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 no definitely it's it's a whole other it's a whole other world that cool. I, that I cool. and then and then also as it's funny because it still is music but but music that i don't necessarily get paid to do so i play a ton of guitar i've like way into i've found this whole other world in the discovered jam bands in my oh, third wow. act and so you know went on saw a bunch of dead shows this year and things like that things that are like not not pop nor um you know popular culture or dance uh uh you know genre from that scene yeah yeah genre yeah i'm just kind of into a whole bunch of other stuff as well and so cool. but it's still always kind of rooted around music all you know a lot of my friendships and everything are with other creators and things like that. Creative, so, yeah. creativity stays with you no matter yeah no matter what you're gonna yeah, it's me. kind of like one of those things like if i wasn't doing music i would still be doing something because I, like, I like making things even if yeah whatever a wood shop or something i like 
I've never been a creating. You like I mean, creating. Yeah, I like <laughs> building things or seeing how things work. Yeah. Come here. Definitely. There you go. Uh, uh, and Barry, same question. <laughs> oh, what what am I doing nowadays? Uh, what's your well? What you would share with us about your current home life, pets, hobbies? Oh, Anything you want to share with us? Well, current home life. I'm now married seven, 16 years. Nice 16 years. A couple of dogs. A lot of big dogs. Giant backyard. No, I'm back to pl- play, playing and singing again. Doing a lot. Doing jam nights with the relatives. That's that. That's another reason that that uh, I married into his family. They're very <laughs> cool as well. They're cool. Yeah, they're cool. I'm, I'm usually on Wednesday nights. Not tonight, but um, playing guitar and doing some originals, doing harmonies and stuff and things oh, like fun. that. So, so, cool. I, so just you know just yeah just uh, absolutely just still doing music again you know in different ways i just sometimes it's dance sometimes it's not you know i just kind of morph all over the place i, I want to say something that i i didn't know until it was kind of right near before the end something i discovered about barry he's an amazing bass player he oh, really mind one day and i never i didn't know you played play play <laughs> and 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 you know we're both musicians and we both you know can do guitar but i remember we had like a little rock jam with a, a old neighbor of mine i remember and barry got on bass and i was like holy crap you're really good i never, <laughs> yeah. I never knew that because i would have but i'm curious about hearing you too <laughs> yeah. so cool. I remember discovering that late i was like wow you're really good <laughs> All right. Well, but to close the show, we usually we always play a quick questions and answers game. So whatever comes to mind, I'm going to ask the same. Just both answer. Your favorite color, Barry? Blue. No, green. Red. Oh Jesus! <laughs> Chris. It's not an essay question. Red for me. Red. Totally. Okay, Red. I, li- I like both. Uh, uh, your favorite flower, Barry? I don't have one. Sorry. Chris. Um. Uh. Iris. Okay, season of the year. Uh, fall. Okay, uh, Chris. I was gonna say fall, so I gotta say spring. <laughs> you can say fall. <laughs> no, yeah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> fall gets me because uh, it's fall right now, so I'm give, give spring a shout out. Why not? <laughs> yeah. <Give> spring. <laughs> uh, what's your idea of a perfect vacation and your favorite place you've ever traveled, Barry? I have without thinking too hard. I have to go. Like a lot of people agree, Puerto Vallarta. Cool, uh, Chris. Fa- uh, favorite favorite vacation dream would be definitely something where 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 the mount where the forest meets the ocean, something like oh, that, like uh, and then something where there's water, but there's also like woods and stuff. Come on, and go to Greece. Really, then really good friends, um, all just kind of like hanging out. Definitely some kind of musical component, but more just like a a nice cluster of really good people. I like it. Uh, have you watched any TV shows or movies recently that you recommend, Barry? I forgot about it, but when I was in Vancouver, my friends were saying that they were into Poker Face again. I forgot all about that. Love it, Poker Face, amazingly oh. great. Nice, uh, Chris. I just recommended something, and it literally just I, <laughs> I, I totally forgot. I, know, and I was remember. just like, oh my god, this is really cool. But I haven't. I've been trying not to watch TV because I want to. I've been think i want to use that time to learn more stuff so. cool fair enough your favorite cuisine barry oh gosh oh i don't know so i skip yeah <laughs> Bar- yes uh, barbecue, I like everything. american barbecue oh uh, cool okay. texas arkansas kansas whatever some kind oh, cool. of barbecue. hard meat <laughs> what's the best dish you make that no one should miss trying very. Mm, oh, I'm sorry, I suck at all these ads. Are you? Oh, really? I'm so you, not a cook. I'm so a microwave. You're not a good cook. Okay. No. Yes, are you? I, I I can cook. Yeah, I can cook. I I used to do a Thanksgiving dinner. I was a good guy. In oh, cool. Of that. So yeah, I can I can I can get around the kitchen. My yeah, barbecue's okay. I'm trying to think if there's something in particular where I'm like. Okay, this is really good. And everybody I, goes, "Oh my God, Chris, I got to come back for this." Yeah, actually, the last few times I've done some stuff in the in the instant pot. I've just usually oh, cool. Know, that's kind of cheating, but um, I don't know. I, and I also, I can bake really good too. Oh, you're a baker. I, I can, yeah, that's uh, why I suck. I'm good at cooking, but I suck at baking. I can do. A, I can do a good. Cake. Nice. Um, what's the ideal way you like to spend a wide open weekend, Mary? 
Oh, a why a why oh just doing nothing, sitting on a, sw- <laughs> a, 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 a swing in the summertime is everything. What I just need myself to sleep, just to shut every shut the world off. Absolutely. I'm imagining Chris would say a music festival of some sort. Uh not necessarily a festival, no. depending on it. Although I do I do love it because it's like summer camp. It depends on the <laughs> and how how far I have to walk. But yeah, there's definitely something about that. But no, I'd say more like a concert mixed in with like a a little jam and a hang, but I, I more often when when there's when everything is completely off, there silence is pretty rad lately. So every nice. now and then, yes. all I can hear is the ringing in my ears. It's not so bad. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like make it stop. stop. I, I feel so guilty if I take a day off. So I like kind of like sometimes I don't until until I'm just pushed to the limit, and then yeah, then usually it'll. Be I do feel guilty too. Yeah. Yeah. If you could have dinner with anybody in the world from across history, who would it be and why? It's a cliche question. But... Across history. Yeah. Uh, Barry. First... Yeah. Right. Oh, let's, yeah, let's skip the order. Oh, well, it's always David Bowie for me, but I'm afraid. Oh, my I, God. Cool. I'm afraid okay. that I would pass out. <laughs> <laughs> Chris. Um, Quincy Jones. Yeah, uh, cool. I would say Prince, but he'd probably be too aloof and probably doesn't eat. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, or or the other one actually would be Steve Lukather, the guitar okay. for Toto. Cool. He's my favorite. Uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be, Barry? I don't know how to answer that. Okay, Chris, I do. <laughs> Stop stopping time. Just stopping time for a minute, so like oh, that's interesting. Readjust things and do things, or like um, I don't know, kind of reassess the situation, and then, and then, yeah, that was always that was always my thing. I fantasized about a kid. I'll see if your uh, answer changes on the one before this. Alive or past, uh, 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 alive or past, and money no issue. Which music, which musician would you love to see uh, perform live? Oh, a lot! Wow. How, well, the question is how many magicians do you, can you actually name <laughs> musicians musicians not oh, mag- music- i thought you said magician i <laughs> know <laughs> musicians sorry musicians oh oh which one would i want to see I, 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 yeah and even if the ticket is like twenty thousand dollars what would yeah it, it still have to be prince it's always going to be prince yeah he, cool he, okay. i nobody can touch him as a performer beautiful ever. very uh, uh, uh well i i but i've already seen david bowie like three or four times you're cool good for you so I, um, I, 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 I kind of no. I, I wish I could have seen Deep Purple, in when they were at the peak, nineteen seventy two or seventy three. I, I would join you for that one. That'd be that, right, when like the, the Machine Head era, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. It'd be pretty awesome. Roger. Uh, a few more questions. A job you would suck at, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> there's too there's too many <laughs> I, I so want to interject comedy yeah <laughs> so I got how about friend <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> ouch <laughs> oh, that's how we do Gary rebuttal <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding okay uh, are you early or late uh, Barry early Early, cool. Great. I, I'm now. I used to be early until one day. I'm like, Why am I always so early? Everyone else, I'm waiting for everyone. So okay. And what's your pet peeve, Barry? One of your pet peeves. No, uh, one of my pet peeves. Um, I, I once again, I don't know how to answer that. Okay. Chris, just... my pet peeve is Barry can't find answers for things. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. honestly, honestly, my my number one thing is when, um communication stops with somebody like the worst thing somebody could ever do is hang up a phone because i think everything can always be solved just keeping communications line open and when people put up a wall and won't talk or won't you know do anything like that 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 just kind of infuriates me and yeah. because I, th- I think it's important that even in bad times you still need to communicate because you can get through anything but that's that's the thing when you talk it's my pet yeah. peeve yeah you gotta talk you gotta cool. talk and last question. What's the number one thing you wish more people knew about you, Barry? That people knew about, knew about you? Yeah. Uh, uh, I wish people knew about me? Yeah. One thing you wish people knew about you that they don't. Uh, I, I, I think I, uh, I, I, 
Oh, uh, I, th I, I don't know. Uh, I don't, once again, I don't know. <laughs> I knew about me. There's, I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of my musicality of people don't understand or realize okay. or get the variety and the different you know, aspects of stuff that I have done and have how many different kinds of hats I can wear. Yeah, and yeah. Have yes. Right, cool. and, and I think a lot of people just want to paint you in one box. Oh, you're just a remix, or you're just this, or you're just this concam one hit wonder. I don't think people realize that I do about seven things at the same time. I like and, that. And write and produce and play and song write and sing. You know, I mean, people don't see the multifaceted me. They just see what they want to see. In yeah. Whichever that, song right. yeah. I have done or been involved in with. You know, like even dive in the pool and putting all that together and stuff like that. People don't see. There's some. There's many things like about that that people do not see. The multifacetedness is that the right word or the right? I word? like that. Something yeah. like that. I and think I'm hoping. I'm, I'm hoping this show, this episode, showed every part of, yeah, of your different stuff. Chris, what would you um, like? I would like people to know that I'm available for work. If you <laughs> DJ or music producer. <laughs> <laughs> he does um, his birthdays and weddings and bar mitzvahs. <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty uh especially in the last couple of years, uh, I'm pretty I'm a way more open book than I ever was before. So there's not okay. a lot of things that people don't know. I I I really like to make people happy. I really like to make people feel good. So like friends, okay. you know, call me with problems or this or that, and I like to I love solving problems. I guess, and not not to say like everyone's personal problem. Like when there's a a challenge or a puzzle or something like that, that's the thing that I kind of um, cool. thrive thrive on. Cool. Is I I like I like being challenged or I like being presented with something nobody's nobody knows how to do this, and I like problem solving. Beautiful. Everyone, send Chris all your problems on Instagram and fit message. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's start the ball rolling <laughs> thank my you new, my new advice show will be <laughs> you know what why not you can you can mix comedy with a bit of music and a bit of adv advice solving problems there you go. Yeah, that's, that's your new that's... That's your, your new path uh this has been one of the most interesting conversations about music that i had in a long long time thank you for spending so much time i don't know how we're gonna edit this episode but it has so much content and i love it and uh it's, it's been a pleasure i'm so so happy that i invited you uh both on the show well, good. Good. yeah thank you antoine it's been really nice and thank you barry for absolutely your time and your very kind words and yeah thank you everyone that's checking love this us out all right, and viewers, thank you for watching and tune in again for the next episode. And we love you. Love yourself always. Very important. Cheers. Cheers.